This lecture is on NMR spectroscopy, part 3. In NMR spectroscopy lectures, parts 1 and 2, there was a discussion of proton NMR spectroscopy. This time, we're going to talk about carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy. It takes a lot more sample to get a carbon-13 NMR spectrum. And the reason for this is that there's only about 1.1% carbon-13 on Earth versus about 100% proton availability. The proton carbon-13 splitting, and they would split because they both have a spin, that's removed to give you only singlets. So you only see single lines or single peaks in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum. Integration is meaningless because uh, carbon-13 will have different size peaks and different areas under the peaks depending on how many hydrogens are attached to the carbons. So we're not going to actually ever do integration for basic carbon-13 NMR spectra. You count the number of unique carbons in the, car the carbon-13 NMR spectrum. So that's what the spectrum tells you. All those different carbons are unique. And you place those carbons as part of functional groups. Okay, and you determine that from a carbon-13 NMR chemical shift table. Symmetry gives you fewer unique carbons than the molecular formula has. And that's to be expected because if the carbon atom is symmetrical to another carbon atom, then that carbon atom will show up as one peak, not two. Here is table four in chapter 11 of my textbook. It provides approximate chemical shift values in carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy. There is a link to table four, chapter 11, in the video description. The type of carbon atoms in the first column represent the carbons in different functional groups, and those are shown in bold, and their corresponding chemical shifts are in parts per million on the adjacent column. And I want to highlight two specific areas, the alkyne and the nitriles, because these are interesting in that in the infrared spectrum, there is complete overlap between where those two functional groups will absorb. But in carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy, there are completely different regions of the chemical shift range. Alkynes show up between 60 and 90 parts per million, whereas nitriles show up at 120 to 130 parts per million, allowing you to easily distinguish between the two types of carbons. Practice problem six. Which of the following isomers is represented by the carbon-13 NMR spectrum shown below? When you examine these isomers, uh, you'll notice that they really have the same kind of functional groups. Uh, there's a benzene ring and there are carbons attached to bromines and there really aren't going to be any differences in that sense since there's, there are two carbons attached to bromines. Uh, hybridization is the same, uh, same types of carbons, so focus on the chemical shift values really won't help you, but focus on symmetry will allow you to distinguish A from B from C because that will distinguish how many unique carbons there are for each isomer. Answer to practice problem six. The first thing you want to do is find out how many unique carbons there are in the isomers. So in isomer A, we know that there is a plane of symmetry, like a mirror plane, that cuts right through carbons two and four, make, making uh, carbons one identical to each other, the ones attached to the bromines, and carbon three, those are identical to each other. So that makes two sets of carbons there, and then the two carbons that are in the mirror plane, carbon 2 in between the bromines and carbon 4, which is farther away, those are also unique. That's a total of four unique carbons. In isomer B, we can split the molecule with a mirror plane down the middle between the carbon bromine bonds, and that gives us three unique carbons that reflect upon each other. In isomer C, we have two reflection planes, one which allows us to find that carbon uh, one, which is attached to the bromines, those carbons are identical to each other because they reflect on each other. And then in the perpendicular sense, we show that 
carbon 2 reflect on each other so that all of those carbons are identical to each other. And that means that we actually have only two unique carbons. And thus, since the NMR spectrum matches that, our answer is C. Now, as I had mentioned, in typical carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy, the spectrum will not show any splitting. You'll only see singlets because we've eliminated all of the splitting between the protons that are attached to carbon-13. So how do we know if we have a CH, a CH2, or a CH3? Or for that matter, a C without any hydrogens? What we do is we combine the carbon-13 NMR spectrum with two other types of spectra, which are called depth 135 and depth 90. Depth 135 produces a carbon-13 NMR spectrum with no peaks for carbons without hydrogens. So there's nothing there at all at that chemical shift. Positive peaks for CH and CH3 groups, meaning the peak is pointing up above the axis, and negative peaks for CH2 groups, which means the peak is pointing below the axis. Dep90 produces a carbon-13 NMR spectrum with only positive peaks for CHs. No other types of carbons show up. So when you combine Dep135 and Dep90, together they assign all of the types of carbons attached to the protons and also with the uh, original carbon-13 NMR spectrum, you know which carbons had no uh, protons attached at all because those are the ones that show up in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum, but don't show up in either depth 135 or depth 90.